Praise the Lord, church. I'd like to welcome everyone back to another online service. As the pastor says, hope everyone's staying saved and safe. I'd just like to go over a few quick announcements for everyone. Remember, if you have any prayer requests, names to add to the prayer list, or any praise reports, please send those to cljcrequests at gmail.com. Uh, since we're unable to pass around the, the fasting calendar, please continue up to do your, your normal dates. Uh, if you're feeling extra generous, you know, throw a few extra meals on there. Well, we need fasting 24 seven during this time. Uh, remember when all of our videos drop, uh, it's 8 a.m. on YouTube for Sundays, 10 a.m. on Facebook for Sunday service. Uh, Brother Thomas's lessons on Wednesdays are available on Wednesday at 5 p.m. on both platforms, as well as our Sunday school lessons that drop on Friday night are available on YouTube and Facebook at 5 p.m. I uh, just want to continue to let everyone know that while we're down here, we're continuing to pray over the names in the box, the soldiers, everything that the elders prayed for when we had service, we're continuing to pray for those things. And also the pastor is continuing to read out the names on the prayer list and he's continuing to pray for them daily. Lastly, we just want to continue to thank everyone that makes this possible. Uh, thank the choir for the songs. Thank Brandon Need for opening their house up to me. I uh, thank for, for everyone that gets the messages ready. Those are down here recording, everyone that edits, uploads, and any part that you played in this. We just want to thank everyone. We thank the pastor for trusting us to do this. And most of all, we want to thank God for making this possible. So if you guys need anything, need help with anything, need someone to talk to, just if you need anything at all, just reach out to us, call, text, email, stop by, whatever it is. We love you guys, we want to help you, and we hope to see you soon. Thank you.
Good morning, good afternoon, church. Hope everyone is doing well. Hope you're staying saved and safe. Um, looking forward to being back in church. We're hoping soon. Uh, continue to remember all of our prayer requests. We still continue to remember the Sutphin family with uh, Miss Peggy's uh, passing away. Also remember Zach Carter, all the people we're fasting and praying for. Continue to send in all of your prayer requests and any praise reports to the, uh, to the website and stuff. We do want to hear that. Um, and again, just continue to remember the pastor, continue to remember all the people in the church, just try to stay connected as much as possible. Again, hopefully soon we'll be hearing something positive about getting ready to get back in the, into the church. I want to continue today on, with our lessons on the great mercy of God. This morning's le uh, lesson is on clinging to righteousness. The focus thought is we must cling to righteousness no matter the evil influence around us. The focus verse is Revelations 2 and 13. I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, and thou beholdest, and thou holdest, excuse me, thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you where Satan dwelt. And then the lesson text is Revelations 2, 12 through 17. And to the angel of the church of Pergamos write, these things saith he which hath the sword, the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is. And thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith. Even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam which taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit hath said to the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name, new name written, which no man knoweth, saying, saving he that receiveth. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you today for all your mercy. God, we thank you for your grace. God, thank you for the Holy Ghost. God, repentance and baptism in your name. Thank you for the doctrine, Lord. We appreciate you and thank you so much for all that you've done, for always watching and keeping us and guiding us, Lord. And just keeping us, Lord, just as, as Jonathan had, had preached about there on Sunday, Lord, there's just, there, there's weight, there's more. There's so many things that you've done for us, God, and we appreciate you. God, provision, all the things, God, we thank you and glorify you, Lord. Just remember this message. God bless my voice. God, ask you, Lord Jesus, God, let all the words be yours and not mine. Let it be from your heart, not my heart, from your mind and not my mind, God. God, I ask you to bless the recording and bless all this, God. I ask you, Lord, to just watch over and let it bless the church as they watch it, God. Bless the people, strengthen and encourage, Lord Jesus, God. Bless uh, this virus, God. Just keep us safe and protected from it and bless our doctors and nurses and all those that are around it. God, I ask you to move on our governor, God, and limit some of these restrictions so we can get back in uh, pretty quick here, Lord. And we appreciate you and thank you for it, Lord, in Jesus' name. <clears throat> and you may be seated. This morning's lesson is again about one of the seven churches of Asia that were mentioned in Revelation. And uh, today's lesson is on the church of Pergamos. And in the lesson text, if you, uh, as we was reading it, if one of the first things that you can take note of is that Jesus said, These things saith he which had the, the sharp sword with two edges. And it's a, the sword that was actually described in chapter 1, verse 16 of Revelation. as coming out of his mouth, and that represents the Word of God. And anything that comes from the Word of God has the ability to cut us if our lives are not right with him. Yes, Jesus loves us, but if we love him, we're going to keep his commandments. And if we don't keep the commandments, then we're going to be cut. Uh, John chapter 14, verse 15 says, If you love me, keep my commandments. That's pretty simple to me. If you love Jesus, if you're going to love him, and you're going to allow him to be your savior, then you're going to keep his commandments. And that's not a new commandment from God. Uh, that was actually mentioned in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 9. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him, and keep his commandments to a thousand 
generations. Those people that love him, those people that love him and keep his commandments, he's going to keep the covenant and he's going to keep mercy with them up through a thousand generations. If you think of a 40 year old, 40 years being a generation, or they, I guess 20 years is a generation, and that's a thousand generations, he's going to keep it up for 20,000 years. God is going to keep his mercy and his covenant. If we don't keep his commandments, though, we don't love him. We show him that we love him through keeping the commandments. <clears throat> yes, Jesus loves us, but we show him that love back to him when we keep his commandments. Jesus saves us, but he only saved those that believe and are baptized, they obey that commandment to be baptized, and those are the people that he'll save. Uh, Mark chapter 16, verse 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And there's a lot of people out there that'll tell you and talk about baptism, and they'll talk about, you know, they'll believe in baptism, but when it comes right down to it, they don't necessarily believe that it is necessary. They think it's a, it's a good thing to have, but it's not necessary for salvation. And my thinking is, is those people evidently have never read these words that are actually in red that came from Jesus. He that believeth and is baptized will be saved. And if you don't believe you need to be baptized, then you aren't. You're not going to get baptized and then you're going to be damned. That's, that's harsh. That's cuts. But that's the word of God. The word of God cuts when you don't keep the commandments. When you don't keep the word, the word of God will cut you. It will cut you going. And if the word of God cuts you today or any other time while you're listening to it, then you need to begin to change the way you're thinking about things. If you're listening to a preacher, you're listening to a teacher, and what they say never cuts you. If it never cuts you in your heart, it never makes you feel guilty, it never makes you feel bad, then you need to start taking a look at um, who you're listening to and what you're listening to or what your brand of self-righteousness is. No matter what good things they say, eventually the Word of God should cut you in something. Uh, I, would have, I would dare say the pastor has been cut by things. He's been cut by his conscience from God. So the sword that you're using, the sword that they're going to be using, it's going to be cut and it, it's going to cut you. And if, you'd listen, if you're listening to somebody and that Word does not cut you, then evidently they're not using the sword that Jesus has, the one that comes out of his mouth, because his, his disciples were even cut by his word. So if you're listening to someone, again, and, and you're listening to who's teaching and preaching, and it's not from the word of God, you're holding on to righteousness, and that's what we're talking about, clinging to righteousness. You're holding on to righteousness of somebody else or from your own ideas. And we have to hold on to the righteousness of Jesus. His thoughts and his requirements for righteousness, and not what we or somebody else thinks about righteousness. It's the word of God that will save you. It's not the ideas of other people. So going back to the churches there in uh, Revelation, <clears throat> and we would said it a couple weeks ago, uh, probably each time we've talked about them. These churches, again, represented, these churches represented individual churches at the time, but they also represent the church as a whole down through time. And so all the things that were preached to these, these things that was written to them, it applies to us. It applies to me. It applies to all of us. And so he began when he was talking to Pergamos, he began to give some praise to them. Revelations chapter 2 verse 13. I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. I know your works. I know what you do. I know where you do them. I see what you do. I see where you do them. And, and I hope we remember this. I hope we get up of a morning thinking about this and we go through our days and we're thinking about this, that God sees us. He sees us where we're at. He sees what we're doing. He sees where we're doing it. He knows what we're doing. And again, he knows where we're doing those things. His eyes are always upon us. Whatever state we're in, he's watching. Whatever it is that we are doing, he's watching. You're do, uh, he said, you're, you're doing your work. He's talking to the church there. And he said, you're doing your work 
where Satan's seated. You're, you're holding fast to my name. You've not denied my faith. Even when one of your members were killed for what you believed in, even though they were killed for my name, you continued to hold on to that name. It didn't bother you. you. You didn't allow that to scare you, that you kept on keeping on. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing. And Jesus had taken note of it. He had seen what they'd done. And, and Jesus made a point to point it out. They had done their work for the Lord right in the middle of where Satan was. They were able to stay faithful and hold on to the name of the Lord and hold on to their faith right in the middle of a city that was full of sin. And it's important to take notice of the things that people accomplish for God. It's important to take note of those things when people accomplish something for God. And it's important also to take notice of where they accomplish it. If me and my family, my entire family worked here at the church all the time and everything we did involved the church, serving God would be so simple, wouldn't it? If all you did was church stuff and you came down and you worked for the church, everything you did was revolving around God, it would be so easy to do the work of God. It would be so simple. I would come down here at the church every morning and I would be praying and I would be meditating on the Lord. I'd be getting whatever message it would be that I needed to get ready. I'd be going out and visiting people and talking to people about the Lord, be doing the, whatever the work is of the Lord. And if all my family was about the Lord's business, it's just not a lot of pressure on us. There wouldn't be a whole lot of pressure put down on us. But if I'm the only one in my house that's serving God, and I have to go to work and work at a place where nobody serves God, or if I have to go to school around a bunch of people that don't serve God, and I accomplish something for God, I've done something. <laughs> if, I, if, if I'm the only person, if you're the only person this morning, this evening, whenever you're listening to this, if you're the only one in your house and you're serving God, and you're going to work at a place where people don't serve God and they're, of all, they're just all over the place. Or you're going to school, man, you're doing something and you do something for God. You've done something. And let me tell you, God notices it. God sees it. He sees where you're at and he sees where you're at. And he sees what, you do, what you're doing. And thank God, God takes notice of what you're doing. It's, I, I mean, personally, I have it easy. My wife, my kids, they're all faithful to God. Uh, I'm working from home still right now. And even when I'm at work, most of the people that a lot of the people I work with, they're Christians or they're good people. It's easy for me to serve God. I'm not around a bunch of just nastiness, if you just want to say worldliness. But you know who you are this morning. You, you, you people that are on your own sometimes, you know who you are. You know that you don't have it easy. And people like me at the church, we should know who you are. We know who you are too. And we should be praying for you and urging you on. But even more important, God knows who you are. Even more important, God knows who you are and he's in your corner and he's on your side and he's saying, I know your works. I've seen what you're doing. I'm watching you every day. I see what you have to put up with. I, I see the things that, you, that you're on your own when you're at home and you're on your own when you're at school and you're on your own when you're at work. And it's a tough place, and, and, but I see what you're doing. But he says, don't be weary in well-doing. Don't be weary in well-doing because you're going to reap if you don't faint, if you just keep on keeping on, God knows. He sees what you're doing and he recognizes it where you're doing it. They held on, Pergamos held on to the name. If you're holding on to the name and you're holding on, you're not denying his faith that you're still doing the work of God and you're all on your own. You're doing it there at Satan's seat. God notices it. He takes notice of it and he'll, 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 he'll bless you for it. <clears throat> Pergamos held on to the name. And when everyone else around them was falling away from the name of Jesus, they were holding on to it. They believed the preaching of the apostles. Acts chapter, 14, uh, chapter 4, verse 2, excuse me. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. God gave Israel the name of Jehovah, and but Pergamos knew his name as Jesus, and they held on to that. Church, 
Hold on to the name of Jesus. Grab a hold of it. Don't let go of it. Hold on to that name. There's no other name that you can get in this world. Buddha, none of these other things will save you. But the name of Jesus, the name of Jesus will save, will save you. The world will tell you that God has many names. And he goes by a lot of titles. He may go by father, son. No, he only goes by one name. If you need to be baptized in the name, it's got to be one. There's only one name to be baptized in. And that is that name, Jesus. There's only Jesus. There's only one name given among men that we have whereby we have to be saved. That only name is in Jesus. First John 5 and 7 says, For there are three that bear record in heaven. There's the Father, there's the Word, and there's the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And we've said, we've said it. When it comes down to the, to the Godhead, these three are one, and it's not in one. There is three in one. They are all one. Enough that we've said that enough that it should leave it beyond the shadow of a doubt. But then Colossians 2, 8 and 9 says, Beware lest any, <clears throat> beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy. They spoil you through the philo their own philosophy and their vain deceit. Or it's after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him, talking about Christ, dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. All those three, they are one and they were in one, and that's Jesus Christ. That means the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost are one and they were in one. When the whole Godhead dwelt inside of Jesus, it was all in him. The fullness, we talked about it, every salvation, everything rolls up into him, and you can't let it go. You can't, you can't deny it. You can't, you gotta, you gotta grab a hold of it. Don't let it, don't be spoiled by the traditions of men. Don't, don't be held captive. Don't let it steal your salvations. Don't vain deceit the traditions a man may say this you know this is okay and that's okay it's not you know it's okay to go down in the water in this way and it's okay to pray this way no there's only one name only one name there's only one folks and let's get that right one they didn't deny that name they held on to jesus their reliance on jesus i said that back a couple of sunday goes uh, sundays ago about talking about a declaration of dependence on Jesus, and, and that didn't come from me. I, I couldn't remember exactly where I heard that from. It actually, came from a, 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 t a book a title of a book that I had seen. But we need to declare our dependence on Jesus. We we need to make our declaration of his, our dependence on Him in our lives. I, I need Him. I need his peace. I, I need his joy. I need his healing. I need his name for salvation. I need his spirit alive, living inside of me. Even when he, they said, even when someone was killed in the church for your faith, you held, Pergamus, you, you held on to that. Even if someone loses their life in the church, we got to keep pushing on. I, I sometimes wonder how committed people are to God and how committed they are to Jesus. And, and if something did happen and, and things did did get, get tough, and we don't know where it's going to go. We don't know how long it's going to be before we start getting into some of the things that's talked about in Revelations, but it could happen any day now. It could happen next week, next month, next year. There could be a, 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 a turning of the minds into the Spirit, but, and if, but something happens, and the person that sits next to you at church or whatever, they lose their life because of the name of Jesus. you got to keep, you got to cling to it. you got to keep holding on. you got to keep pushing on. He said, Pergamus, you kept on even when there was a martyr. Pergamus was a center of emperor worship, 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 worship. And I think Jonathan had said that last Friday for the, the was talking about that in the Sunday school lesson. And so the Christians there were persecuted for not following uh, or following and worshiping like everybody else. People that were Christians were deemed uh, to, 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 for being disloyal because they had worship God, they had worshiped Christ, and so they were thought of being disloyal or they were unpatriotic. <laughs> they were not patriotic for, for worshiping. But before being a patriot, I'm a Christian. Right. Before I know everybody, I'm a, you know, you hear these people that the patriot is that word, is a big word right today, and people, I'm, I'm a patriot. But before I'm a patriot, I'm a Christian. I'm a saint of God. I, I'll throw the patriotism off to the side. And I'll, hold, I'll cling on to Jesus. I love the flag. I love America, but I love Jesus a whole lot more because he's the only one that can save me. Worshiping Jesus, again, one of these days may be shunned here, but we need to determine in ourselves that we're going to hold fast to him. We got to determine that we're not going to deny him, even when people are losing their lives. So the Lord was pointing all these things out to Pergamos, all these things that pleased him and that he was happy with. 
but we know the word. <laughs> we know what the next word usually is that's coming up. Yeah, and these guys said it, but. <clears throat> but, and ver verse 14 starts with a but, and we know that things were happening that God was not pleased with. Revelations chapter 2, 14 through 15. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block, remember that, stumbling block, before the children of Israel, and caused them to basically eat sacrifice unto, to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, Nicolaitans, if I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correct, which thing I, ha which thing I hate. They held fast to his name, and they didn't deny his faith, but they allowed doctrines to come inside of the church <clears throat> that did not in adhere to the things that Jesus taught. Rather than to try to correct the situation, they allowed those doctrines to stick around and that it, and <clears throat> that it got to the point where it might have just been a simple pimple. It might have just been a little scratch. But they allowed those doctrines to stick around long enough that it became a large enough sore that Jesus said, I'm going to have to deal with it. We're going to have to talk about it, Pergamus. You've, got to, you've allowed some stuff to set inside of your church that I'm not pleased with. You've done all this stuff, but there's some things that's got to happen. And there was a, church, there was a warning that they needed to repent. Balaam was an individual in the Old Testament, and I think Jonathan actually mentioned him in one of his messages, whether it was Sunday school or maybe one of the messages he preached a few weeks ago. So he was an individual in the Old Testament, and he was mentioned several times in the New Testament as well. He was a Midianite that had come to gain knowledge of who God was, Jehovah God. He didn't know quite his name, but he knew who God was. He knew the power of God. And he'd had a reputation of those people that he blessed were blessed, and those people that he cursed were curse, cursed. And the king of Moab, Balak, tried to contract him to put a curse on the Israelites that before he would go out and fight them. But God had warned Balaam, against doing this. God said, you know, these Israelites, they're blessed, uh, Balak. They're, they're a blessed people. I have blessed them. So Balaam, when, when Balak had sent the messengers to him to t ask him to come, he said, guys, I, I can't go. You guys are just going to have to go on home. I can't go because God is not going to allow me to do this. But then Balak begins to send messengers again, and Balaam says, listen, if you give me a, a house full of gold and you give me a house full of silver... I cannot go beyond what the word of the Lord God is. But then he went and talked to God, and God told Balaam, he said, if they call again, if they call on you again, then you can go with them, but you're only allowed to speak the words that I give to you. You cannot speak any other words except the words I give you. But instead of waiting for them to call again, Balak goes back with them not Balaam, Balaam goes back with them this time, and that angers God. And you might remember the story about him. He's riding on his donkey, and the donkey sees the angel of the Lord there, and the donkey won't go past it, and he's trying to get the, prod the donkey along, and it throws him to one side, and it messes up his leg. And so he begins to beat on the donkey, and the donkey still won't go forward. It, it, it Basically, the donkey saves his life, and he even says, talks to the donkey, and the donkey speaks back to him. So, But the, base, the, the donkey saves his life, and the angel of the Lord tells him this. And the Lord allows him to continue on to this journey. But again, he tells him, you cannot go past what the Lord says. And so he refuses to curse Israel for Balak and instead ends up blessing them. And so Balak says, listen, just be quiet. Don't say anything at all. I don't, if you're not going to curse them, I definitely don't want you to bless them. But he continues on to bless them even, even more. But somewhere in Balaam's life, something changed. Something happened to Balaam. And we find him in Numbers chapter 31, warring with the Midianites, which, remember, he was a Midianite. And he was warring with the Midianites. He was war warring with his countrymen. He was being a patriot, but he was warring against Israel. He was warring against the Israelites, and he ended up being killed. Numbers chapter 31, verses eight, verse 8, excuse me. And they slew the kings of Midian, besides the rest of them that were slain, uh, namely Evi and Rechem and Zer and Hur and Reba, five kings of Midian. Balaam also, the son of Beor, they slew with the sword. 
So here was Balaam. He, he was not, an, he was not the, uh, one of the children of God, but he knew who God was. He was a man of God. He, was, he talked to God. He had connections with God. He was a Midianite, but somehow or another he had gotten connection, connected with God and he was speaking with God. But what in the world could happen here all of a sudden where he's, God had told him, Israel is blessed. You, uh, I'm going to bless them. You can't curse them. And now he's fighting against Israel <clears throat> when he knew that God had blessed them. And so this is not written out in the Bible exactly what happens, but you have to piece it together. You remember the Bible is sometimes is a mystery and you've got to piece things together. So then Numbers chapter 24 verse 14 it says, And now behold, I go unto my people. Come therefore and I will advertise thee what this people shall do to thy people. In the latter days. And so this is Balaam speaking to Balak just as he's getting ready to leave, but he offers Balak some prophecy concerning his people in Israel, thing that's going to, things that's going to happen. This advertises these, what this people, or Israel, would do to thy people in the latter days. And so the, the words, he was giving him words that God had not given to him to give to Balak. So within himself, he was wanting to try to, to pacify this king and probably had a little bit to do with money when it comes down to it, too. So uh, what he told him, we don't know because it was a private meeting between the two and it's not written down. But it's alluded to in Numbers chapter 31, verse 16. Uh, Numbers 31, 15 and 16. And Moses said unto them, have you saved all the women alive? They had been in a, in a war and they had saved these women alive. And, and Moses like, have you saved these women? He said, behold, these, or we're talking about the women, they caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to commit trespass against the Lord in the matter of Peor. And there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. So these women had caused Israel somewhere to somehow to, to, to have a, commit a trespass against God. They caused Israel to commit a trespass. And it, the counsel came from Balaam. And it said it was in the matter of Peor. So what, what's, what's the matter with Peor? What's the matter? What's this matter of Peor? And that took place right after Balaam had left Balak and they had their private conversation in Numbers 24. The matter of Peor took place in Numbers chapter 25. Um, if y'all would bring those up and I'll just talk about them. So Israel's men began to mix with the women of Moab. And so they sacrificed and they began to bow down to their, to their gods, to their little G gods. So basically they were mixed with the women and they were committing fornication. Okay, So they wasn't married to them and they were committing fornication. And so the women kind of lured them into uh, bowing themselves down and sacrificing to the gods. And it said that they jo joined themselves to Baal, Peor, or it's the Lord of the Gap, and that is the deity that was worshipped in that town of, of Peor. So it said, uh, Psalms uh, 106.28, I don't know if I gave that to you guys, I didn't, but in Psalms 106.28 it says that they ate the sacrifices of the dead in Psalms uh, 106.28. So here they've committed fornication and they've eaten things that were sacrificed. And so God had sent a plague to hit the nation that ended up killing 24,000 people. And, and this is all found in Numbers 25. And it was only stopped after Eleazar ran an Israelite man who was, had taken a Midianite woman in his tent with him and he ran them through with a javelin. He ended up killing them and that's what stopped the plague. They went from blessing God, being a blessed nation of God to being plagued. That's Israel just that quick. They were blessed one, in one chapter and God wouldn't allow Balak to curse them to all of a sudden in the next one they're cursed and God sends the plagues and kills 24,000 24, of them. So Balaam, so we're continuing talking about Balaam here. So Balaam had evidently told Balak more than some future about his country. He had let them, he had let them in on a secret strategy of how to get the Israelites to lose favor with God. He said, behold, Moses said, behold thee talking about those women they had allowed to live after the battle. He said, these women caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to commit trespass against the Lord. In other words, send your women down there. 
Send your women down there amongst the men and let them entice them. Let them commit fornication. Let them lure them in. And then just get them to bow down to their gods. That's, that's Israel's Achilles heel, is the women and the false gods. That was the two things that they, that was their biggest Achilles heel. So they will follow after other gods and then their big G God will become jealous and then he'll punish them. He did this so that, again, he could tap into some of the monies of old Balak. Chapter, uh, 2 Peter 2 and 15 says, which, were forsaken the right way, which have forsaken the right way and have gone astray following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. Balaam and his, deed, his deeds are mentioned seven times in the Bible after he died. Three times, and it's mentioned three times in the New Testament. So it's something that God wanted to warn even us about. Even before Revelations, it was mentioned in Second Peter. And, uh, maybe it was Jude. I'm not, I can't remember exactly where the other time it was mentioned. But it, besides what was in Revelations. So Pergamos had had that doctrine of Balaam. Whatever that doctrine of Balaam was, they had that doctrine in there. They had that doctrine. And so Balaam had taught Balak how to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel. So that's what the doctrine of Balaam was. It was having the ability to cause the, stain, the saints to stumble. It was a stumbling doctrine. It was some way that you could get the saints of God to stumble on something. There were people in the church there at Pergamos who were able to plant seeds of doubt, and they were allowed to call stumbling blocks to the saints, and they planted those seeds of questions, it's okay or it's all right seeds. It's those, this is okay, and, and this is all right. That, that's those seeds. Uh, this is okay, and oh, go, go ahead, and it's okay to make this shorter, and it's okay to make that longer, and it's okay to, to watch this, and it's okay to, to drink that, and it, it's okay to partake in this, because God, God don't care, because God's full of mercy. God's full of grace. It's, it's, don't worry about it. It's something small. It's something very little. It's, it's not a big deal in the grand scheme of, uh, of salvation. This was the doctrine of Balaam, is that he was causing people to stumble. They could call, there was people in the church there, per, Pergamos, that were s s uh, spouting out these little seeds to other s saints, and it was causing, causing them to stumble. And he said, it's not a big deal, but it is a big deal because it's a stumbling block. It's something that causes people to fall. And Jesus had told Pergamos, he said, you're allowing these people to hang out in your church. Quit it. I am not, you've, you've, not, you've, you've held fast to my name. You've done, you've done work in, the, in Satan's seat. You were able to accomplish things for me in the middle of a city that, that, that was Satan. I mean, you were doing works for me. You've held on fast to my name. You're doing these things. But you've allowed these people to be in, in the church that are throwing stumbling blocks. I want you to quit. That, that was enough to almost negate because it was the word but. It negated those things that God had praised them for because you've allowed this stuff to go on. A stumbling block doesn't have to be an eight by eight timber. It can be a little piece of bark that's off of a tree because if you're not on a rock solid foundation, if you're not, feet's not gripping a rock solid foundation and you come across something just the slightest little bit that's a stumbling block, you're headed for a fall. You're headed for a hard fall, and you may be hard enough to cause a plague, just like what happened to Israel in your life. <clears throat> Those questions cause a falling away from the righteousness of God and have you leaning on to your own ideas of righteousness or what somebody else's ideas of righteousness is. Oh, I can live by my rules. I, can, I don't need the righteousness of God. I, I have my own brand of salvation. I, I've got a generic, the generic salvation, the, the generic is, the brand of salvation is, is just as good as the name brand salvation, isn't it, Brother Jonathan? Generic is just as, that don't work in Fruit Loops, okay? I don't like generic Fruit Loops. I, I want the real thing. When I go get cereal, I want the real thing. I want real Fruit Loops. I want real Frosted Flakes. I want real Mini Weeks. That doesn't work in Fruit, the generic is not as good as the brand. It don't work in cereal, and it definitely doesn't work in the righteousness and the doctrine of God. I don't want generic salvation. Salvation. I don't want generic righteousness. I don't want generic doctrine. I want the real thing. I want the one that's got the brand name on it. I want the one that's got Jesus Christ on it. And we've said many times, righteousness is what? 
Being right with God. That's all it is. It's very simple. Righteousness is just being right in God. It's living and walking by the commandments of God. And he said, remember, if you love me, you'll do what? You'll, commit my, you'll keep my commandments and you won't keep your own. You won't keep your own ideas. And when you move towards things that are right in your eyes or are right in somebody else's eyes and not in God's eyes, then you're moving away from God's ideas of salvation, and you're moving toward that generic brand of salvation. Romans chapter 10, 1 through 3 said this, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer for Israel, for God, to, my prayer to God for Israel is this, that they might be saved, because right now they're not. Israel's not saved. For I bear them record, they got a zeal. They got a zeal toward God, but it's not according to knowledge. He said, for they are ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have having not have not doing all this they they've been ignorant of god's righteousness and they're going about establishing their own set of righteousness and in doing that they have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of god they failed they failed to submit to the righteousness of god through loving him and keeping his commandments. They instead arrogantly, and when you, self, uh, let's just get, let's get down to the heart of the whole thing. Self-righteousness is arrogance. You think that what I think is better than what God thinks. You think that way I think I should live is better than what the pastor preaches. You think the way I want, I'm arrogant enough to think that I'm above God. I am arrogant enough that, and let me, go back and read Numbers 25. I didn't bring it out. Go back and when I talked about that, that Israelite man and that Midianite woman, that, that Eleazar ran through the javelin. I didn't read it, but when he brought that woman in, the Bible said that he brought her out in front of Moses and walked into his tent. He was arrogant enough that he, he knew he wasn't supposed to be doing this, but here's an Israelite man taking a Midianite woman and takes her into the tent, and bam, here comes the plague, and Eleazar, to get rid of it, stick, throws the jab, puts the javelin through him and her at the same time. So imagine what they were doing, okay? And that's the arrogance. That guy was so arrogant that he, here's the man of God, and right in front of the man of God, I'll just take sin and take her right into my tent. That's what I'm going to do. And when you're so arrogant in your self-righteousness that you think I'm above the laws of God, I'm above the preaching of the pastors. As long as it's in the Word of God, folks, and the pastor's preaching it, we've got to stick to it. And when you think that I don't have to do this, I can do whatever I want, dress any way I want, uh, talk any way I want, watch whatever I want, you're arrogant, and God hates arrogance. God hates, and that's what self-righteousness is. It is arrogance. It's you saying, my ways are above God's ways. My ideas of salvation are above God's ideas of salvation. Paul said, I don't want any part of that stuff. He said, I'd rather suffer. I must much rather suffer and win the mercy and the grace of Jesus. Philippians 3, 8 through 10 says, Yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss. I've suffered the loss of all these things, and I count them all as dung that I might win Christ and be found in Him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, he said, but that which is through faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship is of sufferings being made conformable in his death. He said, when I walk in my own righteousness, I'm walking in the law. And then I am bound by all the things that are under the law. And let me tell you what the law does not contain, mercy and grace. When I walk in my own righteousness, and I'm not walking in the right, I'm not following the commandments of God, and I'm not doing the things of God, and I'm doing whatever, I'm free willing, baby. I'm, I'm free willing in, the, in, in grace. I'm, oh, I'm in the mercies and grace of God. No, you're not, because you're walking in the law. You, when you're not following the commandments of God, you're walking the law, and you're bound by the things of the law, and grace and mercy, read it in the Old Testament. It ain't even mercy. It's not mentioned in there. There ain't no mercy, and there ain't, I want, there ain't no mercy, and there ain't no grace. I want the mercies of God. I want the grace of God, and the only way I I can attain the mercies and grace of God is by getting the righteousness of God. That is, you, oh my God, there's so many people that just walk out there, oh, I'm, I'm the, Jesus is going to save me, his love and his grace, I can do whatever it is. No, you can't because you're under the law. And when you're under the law, you're not under grace. You're not under mercy. Grace and mercy, oh, I want the love and I want the love, I want the grace, I want the mercies of God. And if I want that, I've got to have the righteousness of God. 
When I walk in my own righteousness, I don't have grace and I don't have mercy. When I walk in the righteousness of Jesus, then I know him in the power of his resurrection. I know him in his love and I know him in his mercy. But to walk in his righteousness, I've got to keep his commandments and not my own. And that's the struggle. Brother Johnny Lee said it, I think, last Friday. That's the struggle. He said it's hard for people to be different in the world. It's hard because people want to fit in. They want to do their own thing. It's hard for people to do that. But not when you forsake it. When you said, it's all done. All that stuff, I count it all as lost as long as I get the righteousness. As long as I make it to heaven, I don't care about anything else. The word is not open to my private interpretation. Well, 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 I think, no, but I think Jonathan talked about that Friday too. Well, then let your thoughts save you. If you think, well, I think, let your thoughts save you. Let your thoughts heal you. And let your thoughts deliver you. And let your thoughts give you grace. And let your thoughts give you peace. And let your thoughts give you joy. Because that stuff only comes from God and not another. Okay, we've seen in this past year what our thoughts can do. And it ain't done us a whole lot. In this past year, our thoughts ain't got us anywhere. David said in Psalms 9 and 8, he said, God shall judge the world in righteousness. He shall judge the world in righteousness. He shall minister judgment to the people in uprightness. Rightness. God is going to judge. Yes, he's, oh, oh, Jesus loves us. He's, oh, he's not going to, oh, he's not going to let me go to hell. (laughs) He's going to judge the world in his righteousness, not in our idea of what righteousness is. His righteousness and not the righteousness of another. And definitely like mine, because mine's not any good. Well, all this is what the world is going to be judged by. God said to Pergamos, you've allowed a doctrine to come in and have a seat in the church that casts these kind of stumbling blocks to people. You've held fast to my name. You didn't deny my faith. But you've allowed this doctrine, these beliefs to come in that will cause people to stumble. Revelations 2 and 16. Repent or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against not Pergamos so much. He said, I'm going to fight against them with the sword of my mouth. I loved it when Brother Jonathan was talking on Sunday. He was talking about the the message. He was talking about it's like an infomercial, all the blessings that God gives us. But wait, there's more. You get grace and you get mercy and you get peace and joy. But wait, there's more and there's this and there's that and all the things of God. But God says here, I'm going to fight against them with the sword of my mouth. In other words... All that stuff's going to be gone when it comes to preaching. I'm going to have to be preaching on them people. And you're not going to... Pergamos, if you don't repent, all these good messages that talks about the blessings of God and all the benefits and all the good things of God is all going to turn into God dealing with the sin and all the other junk that's going on. And you're not going to get all this good meat that makes you grow. You're going to just get foot stomping stuff. All you're going to get is this stuff that just stomps and beats and bangs on your foot and makes you feel guilty and makes you get down further and further and further and further into, into the seat until you're ready to crawl up underneath it. I want the good word. I, I want to repent and say, God, give us a word that lifts us up. God gives a word that establishes us. God give us a word that builds us up. God gives us a gives us healing, God, and give us peace and, and give us joy and give us grace and, and give us mercy. God, don't beat and bang on us. But to do that, we've got to get rid of these false doctrines. You got to you have to guard against doctrines that will put stumbling blocks out in front of us. And that's why you just don't listen to anybody. You just don't listen to anybody. You vet them out. What do they believe? What do they teach? Because doctrine is important. Hebrews 13 and 9 says, Don't be carried away. Don't be carried about with diverse and strange doctrines. Don't be carried about with diverse and strange doctrines, for it's a good thing that the heart be established with grace. He said, Don't be carried away about these things. Don't follow after doctrines that are diverse from the Word of God. Don't be carried away. Don't follow every new thing. Paul warned Timothy that the people will not be able to handle sound doctrine in the last days. 2 Timothy 4, 3 through 4 says, For the time will come where they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts, after their own desires, they'll heap to themselves teachers. They'll have, man, itching ears. I want to get somebody that speaks good things to me. And they shall turn away their ears from truth and shall be turned into fables or doctrines that are made up by man. 
I want the truth, God. I, saw, I don't want generic salvation. I don't want generic doctrine. I want the true salvation. Don't turn to that stuff. Run away from it. Don't hold to the teachings of man. Don't hold even to your own ideas about salvation because they cannot save you. Cling to Jesus and his righteousness. The culture connection of the book opened up talking about a remora, and that's a, a sucker or type of cleaning fish that's in the ocean. And so this fish doesn't have a swim bladder, so it must be, it's got to be in constant motion all the time for in order for it to stay buoyant. And so uh, you see some fish sometimes are able to just sit there and hover around and, you know, because they don't have to go nowhere. That's my poor Im imitation of a fish. Uh, they don't have to go anywhere. They can just sit there and hover, but this fish can't do that. So you can imagine how much energy that fish has to spend every day just to continually move and move and move. But God's given it a secret weapon to help combat this. It's given his sucker mouth. It latches on to other larger fish, and if you've ever watched the series Blue Planet or some of these other things on there, you've seen sharks and that, those other big fish swimming around. There's always these little fishes that's attached to them, and that's what it is. And they, they ride on these big fish, and they clean they clean them. They ride them around and you got all these big scary fish and you got these little fish that rides on them. And on our own in this world, we can't stay afloat spiritually. There's nothing in us that's righteous. That's what the power's flicked a couple times and we better hurry up. We can swim and swim and swim trying to be right enough on our own for salvation, but all we're doing is wasting our salvation. And if, even if we do, or wasting our energy, and even if we do attain to some type of righteousness on ourselves, my righteousness is as filthy rags. He, Isaiah 64, 6. But we are all as unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. Strong's also calls us the best deeds of guilty people. <laughs> There's nothing about our deeds that will remove any kind of guilt. Nothing I do. I can, if I go through the stop sign or if I get caught speeding, I'm guilty. I've broken the law. I am guilty of that. I, I can buy the police officer lunch. I can go buy a homeless person a lunch. I can work at a soup kitchen and feed everybody there, but it's still not going to remove my guilt. may get people to overlook it, but I'm still guilty. But there's one thing that we can cling to in this world, one thing that, can, that we can hold on to, one person whose righteousness we can hold on to that has the ability to clean us. And it's the opposite of that remorse. He has the ability to wash us and make us whole and to give us that righteousness, and that's Jesus. Cling to his righteousness, love him, and keep his commandments. Let's pray. God, we thank you, Lord, for your mercy, grace, all the things you've done for us, everything, always watching, keeping us, guiding us, and blessing us. Lord, we thank you, Jesus, God, for your righteousness that we can cling on to, God, that can give us salvation, Lord, your righteousness and not our righteousness, your idea of righteousness and not our ideas. God, it's a brand name, God. It's got the name of Jesus stamped on it for approval, God. Let us cling on to your righteousness, God. Let us cling on to you, God, to your doctrine, the doctrine of Jesus Christ, God, of repentance and baptism in the name and the infilling of the Holy Ghost and walking before you a, a clean, lifted up life. God, we praise you, God. We thank you, Lord Jesus. God, go with the church. God, strengthen us, Lord. And if we got any of those people that are out there casting stumbling blocks, let's either let them repent and change or let us get rid of them, Lord. Or you move them out. You take care of them, Lord. God, go with us this week and bless us, God. We thank you and praise you and give you glory in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Church, we love you. It's Easter weekend. Hope you have a, a, a good Easter. Keep your mind on what Easter is all about, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and looking forward to hear from the pastor on Sunday. Have a great day.
Set me 